Part 3. Appendices and References. Appendix 1. First Document on Education. Document of Mother Maria de los Santos Martes. The first document about education comes to us from Mother Maria de los Santos Martes, a member of the original nucleus of the Handmaids and Secretary to St. Rafaela between 1877 and 1887. This handwritten document, without a doubt dating to before 1861, with phrasing from that time period, which might be surprising to us today, provides us with a rich understanding of the foundations of our educational activity. The inspiration that drives this document is identical to that of the Constitutions. Mother Martes used the life of St. Madeline Sophie Barat, foundress of the Society of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, written by the priest Monsieur Bonnard and translated to Spanish in 1877 as source material for this writing. In the first book of the biography, the author discusses educational structure and planning. Mother Martes daps the document of the Society of the Sacred Heart, substituting and making changes according to what was fitting for our institute. Teaching in the Congregation of the Reparatrices of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Spirit of this teaching. What constitutes the substance and an object of this teaching is to educate in knowing the Sacred Heart of Jesus so that he may be loved, served, and imitated, all of which embraces the spirit of reparation, which is the spirit of this institute, and the objective toward which all of the institute's legislation is aimed. From this follows the aspect in which this work is outstanding, that is to say in its nobility, which corresponds to the supernatural nobility of its object and end. Its objective would already be sublime, even if it only sought to illuminate the mind and orient the interests of the student. But unless one takes the stance of the religious, reparatrices of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, it is impossible to truly understand in depth the underlying principle and true end of their institute. Because of their vocation and spousal consecration, these reparatrices of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, before considering themselves teachers, belong to their spouse, Jesus Christ, only subsequently comes the role of teacher and apostle, and to think that the primary end of the institute is teaching would be a grave error. No, the primary end is, rather, reparation to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. This is what has been a constant in the institute from its beginnings, and which has been repeated in its statutes and rules, inspired by the words of our Lord Jesus Christ to blessed Margaret Mary Alacoque. Behold, the heart which has so loved men, and yet receives, from most nothing except offense and ingratitude, and remembering these other words, whatsoever you do for the least of these little ones, you do unto me. The Institute looks only to the Sacred Heart of Jesus in its fulfillment of this important charge. Thus, the teachers must procure in carrying out their charge nothing less than the greatest alleviation and reparation of the offenses which the Sacred Heart of Jesus receives, due mainly to the ignorance about our divine religion, which prevails in general, but especially among the simple people. In order to achieve this holy goal, they must notice, respect, venerate, and one could even say adore in their students the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has redeemed them, baptized them, must be their sustenance in this world and their crown in the next, and who holds them in his heart. Their task is no other than that of making the lights, grace, and life of Jesus Christ reign and grow in the girls' souls, so that their young hearts may be converted to the adorable heart of the Lord, introducing them to that heart which is the center and focus of the ardent love which he has for men. If they truly want to win the hearts of the girls, it must be only with the intention of winning them for the heart of Jesus. If the love they have for the girls is to be truly tender, but without weakness, familiarity, or favoritism, pure, disinterested, generous, that is to say, a love that conforms to the spirit of the rules of the congregation, they must learn love from the heart of Jesus. If they have to consider the poor beloved of the heart of Jesus, by definition with a special predilection, as those to whom they must consecrate their teaching and work, such love must spring from the fact that Jesus is the father of the poor, specially beloved by his heart, those to whom he himself wanted to reveal himself as the most complete example. Finally, if they desire that their work, their struggles, and their sufferings be sweet and light, it will be because they realize that they are instruments of the mercy of God toward souls, souls for whom he chose to die on the cross, and they are the chosen part of his flock, 
carrying out an excellent work of reparation. Striving to draw to him these fragile souls, since hell leaves no stone unturned in wrenching them away. In view of this, how could they not consider themselves blessed by the gift of suffering something in order to give the most sacred heart of Jesus this comfort, given that so many toil even harder in order to fill his heart with suffering? The sacred heart, then, has to be the first principle and model which inspires the reparatrices in their work of teaching. The object and end is to contribute through education to the greater reparation of this divine heart. It is Jesus that they must promote in the world by means of these girls who tomorrow will be women and will seal their homes and families with the seal of Christ Jesus, thereby allowing the sacred heart to reign there. And with him, peace, order, and happiness which brings with it the faithful accomplishment of their duties. How much good and how well a Christian wife can do, a virtuous mother who is attentive to her obligations, do we not see many husbands converted because of the example, the concern, the humility, and the prayers of their solidly virtuous wives? How many children must owe their eternal happiness to a mother who pleases God? Finally, the Institute, after having managed to make the sacred heart of Jesus reign on the earth and offering him this tribute of reparation by means of teaching, looks to the coming of his reign in heaven. For this reason, the sisters must keep in mind the Joe they will have when they, one day, will be able to present the hearts of an innumerable multitude of girls, who molded in conformity to the divine model, will be in turn instruments of reparation to the sacred heart, who will propagate his worship, his love, and his glory. Understood thus, the work of education, is not only a maternal office, but also a priesthood. It follows, therefore, that the school for girls is more than a supplement to home life. It becomes a sanctuary in which students are encircled by the presence and love of God. Another characteristic of our education should be its solidity. Solid piety, solid teaching, solid learning of the responsibilities and work appropriate for women. First of all, in the area of religion, it avoids anything that is soft, vague, trivial, and superficial. Truly one of the greatest dangers for women in this current age is being immersed in a piety that is false, or one that is pinned down like a butterfly that is, of course, if they are not reduced to total religious ignorance. Therefore we see so many girls, who, turning from the most tender acts of piety, give themselves over to worldly pleasures, all because religion has been a sentimental worship without roots in faith, the fear of God, and horror at sin, a disastrous sentimentalism, which separates them forever from God and draws them down the path to the horrors of hell. At the same time, ignorance of Christian duties leads so many young women, especially those from the more humble class of society, to perdition which could be avoided with a solid religious instruction given to their class. Far from building girls' piety and virtue upon that foundation of shifting sand, the congregation wants to give them a base that Basut calls the mysterious austerity of the Christian life. And for that reason, in order to establish the foundation in its truest principles, the statutes places Christian doctrine as the principal study for the girls, and the primary aim of the girls and of the course of studies. Instructing the girls in sacred history and the dogmas of religion with the seriousness, solidity, and breadth that is called for confirms them in the faith and in the holy fear of God, the beginning of all wisdom, and turns their hearts, tender by nature, to the most lovable heart of Jesus, while at the same time moderating this tenderness, making them accustomed to always seeking greater perfection, showing them, without euphemisms or attenuation, the austere mystery of the cross, and encouraging them, by the example of Jesus Christ to work, suffer, and sacrifice themselves for him. In order that the fruits of their piety may also be solid, we will help them understand that true virtue consists in each person carrying out well the duties of her particular state, and that any piety not based in this principle is vain, dangerous, and a fleeting illusion. Lastly, with the goal of giving their piety the highest and most solid model possible, the girls will be formed in the knowledge and love of Jesus Christ, whose most adorable person offers them, in a simple and attractive way, a practical example of all virtues.
Thus, preserving students from the most frequent errors and defects of womanly piety, the educational system of the Institute attempts to counteract vague distortions of piety by a real and positive faith and counteract mere sentimentalism through the use of reason and the practice of genuine duties. Instruction, defined strictly, must be as solid as the religious education. There is no reason why or purpose for making women deep wells of knowledge education of women, Fenelon says, just as men's education must be proportional and fitting to their respective responsibilities and offices. Therefore, the instruction that this institute provides to poor girls will be limited to teaching them to read well, write, and do arithmetic, and in regard to practical skills, those appropriate to their sex, especially the most essential and ordinary abilities for the management of a household. Truly, given that the primary and normal roles for women are those of wife and mother, they need to know many things in order to fulfill their tasks well. First of all, intelligence, cultivated with circumspection and care makes them agreeable and edifying in their dealings with their peers and capable of speaking of useful things in conversation. As far as the duties of women in general, as wives, they must know what is necessary in order to be, in as far as possible, at the same level as their husbands in heart and mind, so that they can be pleasant company, timely advisors, edifying examples, and, if it were necessary, capable of giving prudent warnings or respectful admonition. As mothers, lastly, they must know everything necessary to teach their children Christian doctrine and their first ideas of religion and knowledge of God, guide them in the practice of their first virtues, initiate them in the knowledge of the duties of day-to-day -day life and domestic chores, and accustom them to the exercise of the work appropriate for their class and circumstances. In a word, place within them the seeds of truth and virtue, which will later render fruit for the good of the children themselves, the church, and the nation. A woman must know all of this, which is certainly not a little, but nothing more than this, avoiding, which the congregation tends to do, anything vain or superfluous, and for this reason anything which has no purpose except for feeding one's vanity, and is not rooted in the spirit of humility and proper simplicity as is fitting and characteristic of the Christian religion, is entirely excluded. We should prefer in our schools what is useful to what is enjoyable, offering as a model the valiant woman found in the sacred scriptures, who works the spindle, weaves wool and flax, and performs commonplace tasks. Such are the object and end which the congregation of reparatrices of the sacred heart of Jesus proposes in its work of education. The character of this work serves as a guideline for training the religious who will be teachers. From the outset, given that it is their duty to instruct, it is necessary that they themselves be instructed, and the Institute gives full attention to this in the novitiate. However, in this regard, the Institute also professes great caution realizing that the tree of knowledge produces very different kinds of fruits. Thus, against the type of knowledge which parges souls, it seeks that the degree of study not be such that it would diminish the spirit of recollection and fervor. Against the knowledge that puffs up, the Institute wants above all things to inculcate a spirit of humility and simplicity, and the teachers should take care to avoid a presumptuous desire to become know-it-alls, because women of that sort are completely ridiculous. It is essential that they be instructed, so that they can in turn teach their students, but within judicious limits, because it avails nothing having taught many things and wasted a great deal of time in learning them, if they do not know how to win hearts, correct consciences, and speak words of life to souls. As it is a work of abnegation, as well, education demands not only teachers with knowledge, but also mothers who are everything for their daughters, and so each one, but especially the headmistress of every school, must consider herself a mother to all the girls who are entrusted to her care, having toward them the genuine love and concern of a tender and solicitous mother, above all a Christian mother, who treats their souls with that care and concern with which one handles priceless fragile vessels. Moreover, another detail, is that since in order to carry out an act of such abnegation, one needs physical strength, the congregation does not want its religious to exhaust their strength, but rather care for their wellness as a gift from heaven, not doing so out of self-concern, but rather because in order to dedicate themselves more assiduously to their beloved girls, and to the other obligations which their state calls for, they need physical and mental strength. 
For this reason, in the congregation, the way of life is common and ordinary, healthy and sufficient food, obligatory recreations, and seven and a half hours of sleep. In the same way, there are no additional vigils and austerities mandated by the rule other than the fasts of Fridays and those of the days of precept. Does this mean that the rule prohibits all voluntary penance? No. Is it possible that one could love Jesus without being enkindled by the cross? Again, no. Could it ever be true that the reparatrices of the Sacred Heart of Jesus conceive of religious life without mortifications, worship without sacrifice, or apostolate and reparation without immolation? And what religious and teacher would not know how many times the best way of saving a soul is to suffer for it, and that there are moments in which, as sacred scripture states, to carry out the works of God carelessly is equivalent to denying it the testimony given in blood. Lofty, then, in its objectives, solid in its foundation, discreet and altruistic in its exercise, this is, in a few words, the character of the teache, which the congregation of reparatrices of the Sacred Heart of Jesus seeks to practice, conforming to the spirit of reparation, which distinguishes the Institute. In order to fulfill this completely, what is necessary, that the religious be holy, may they begin with their own sanctity, and see how they make others holy, may they live the life of Jesus themselves, and see how this life is enkindled in others, to seek one's own perfection, is the principal and most necessary means to sanctify and improve one's neighbor. For this reason, in the summary of the constitutions, one of the things which is proposed as part of its objective, is the care, not only for the salvation of one's own soul, by divine grace, but with the same grace strive intensely to help in the salvation and perfection of the souls of one's neighbors. In these words it clearly makes it understood that the first task of the religious is to procure their own sanctification, which will allow them to work fruitfully in the care of the souls of their neighbors. Thus it is that the religious, being always attentive to their own growth in perfection, and to the sanctification of their neighbors, and all of this with the goal of giving glory and continual reparation to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, will be perfectly faithful to their vocation, and, being full of trust and merits, will gain eternal glory and be united with their Divine Spouse for eternity. Appendix 2. Legislation. Writings of greatest significance to education, selected from our first statutes, constitutions, and the decrees and orientations of general congregations. First Plan of the Institute, 1875. With the occasion of the departure of our foundresses from the Sisters of Mary Reparatrix, the Archeacon and Cantor of the Cathedral of Cordoba, in agreement with the foundresses, composed the first plan of the Institute in order to solicit the diocesan approbation of the Institute from the Bishop of Cordoba, Fr. Seferino Gonzalez, this document is of great importance, since from this moment on, education, understood in the broadest sense, will form part of the foundational charism of the Institute. We intend to erect a congregation of religious of simple vase who profess a dual life both contemplative and active, the former having as its principal objective the perpetual adoration of the sacramental presence of Jesus exposed, and the latter having as its goal the religious and social education of the girls and young women who place themselves under their direction, education, which will be totally free for the destitute. None of what has been said excludes other works of charity or beneficence that, according to the times and circumstances, the legitimate superior deems appropriate, if religious indifference, is to be combated, a necessary foundation must be the practical education in the theological virtue faith, and nothing is better suited to this objective than the perpetual and public worship of the most august sacrament of our altars, author and perfecter of our faith. Acknowledging him, as happens in our case, by means of constant prayer, and finally, by making amends for the many blasphemies, sacroges, and profanations committed in our days, gives value to and increases the importance of this worship. With this one solid base in place, it also indispensable, in order to avoid unrest and achieve social regeneration, that the minds, hearts, and wills of its members be taught about, develop according to, and be governed in perfect conformity with evangelical precepts and maxims, in all that constitutes Christian education, whose accomplishment is nowhere undertaken with more zeal, more accuracy, and with better fruit than in religious institutes. These two objectives, prayer and teaching, 
being the same as those proposed by the one whose approval is sought for the erection of this foundation. It is clear that divine providence offers us in this institute a powerful means to obtain not only the spiritual good of the church, but also salvation and social regeneration in our diocese. Situates of 1880 On February 27, 1880, Cardinal Morno, the Archbishop of Toledo, gave definitive approval to the statutes. In number three of the same statutes, it is specified, in a very concise way, how to carry out education in practice. They will also dedicate themselves to teach Christian doctrine, free of charge, to poor girls who go regularly to their schools as day students, and keeping in mind the circumstances of the times, and always with the approval of the ordinary, will be able to receive some boarders in order to instruct and educate them as Christians, without fees beyond that which will be necessary for the costs incurred by the said boarders, who will live separate from the community, in the grounds of the enclosure. eighteen eighty six constitutions in the eighteen eighty six handwritten copy of the first constitutions written by mother pillar with some pages written by mother purissima which would be presented to the sacred congregation of bishops and regulars for the pontifical approbation of the institute the apostolic activity of the institute is now expressed very clearly in terms of reparation and as a response to what the church and society required fourth part chapter one Number 1. As the principal end of this institute is reparation of the offenses which the Sacred Heart of Jesus receives from people in these calamitous times, not only by way of their ignorance and disdain for the religious worship, especially for the Holy Eucharist, which is owed to God our Lord, but also through the evil and corrupting instruction which spreads day by day, this institute takes as means for reparation the adoration of the blessed sacrament exposed every day and many nights of the year in its churches, and the free education of its poor day students. Also, if, because of the circumstances of the times, it is deemed appropriate to receive some boarding students in order to give them a Christian education, this is possible with the approval of the general. Number 11. Between five and six hours of instruction will be given in our schools every day except for holidays. Sisters will be designated for schools by the superior, without distinction in terms of their grade, a certain number of sisters for each one of the choir. Sixth part. Chapter 2. Number 4. Teaching will be free of charge for the poor, to such a degree that not even small gifts will be accepted in exchange for it, especially in the case of girls who attend the school or their parents, and among girls, those with greater poverty will be given preference in admission. If it is seen that they lack the means to supply themselves with books and other supplies for their schoolwork, everything will be provided to them with the greatest charity in the Lord our God. Number 5. In the same way, both for those who spend some time in our houses to make the spiritual exercises and for wealthy girls, should we establish in some communities for aforementioned reasons a boarding school, they will not be charged more than is judged necessary for their food and for other expenses that they incur. This is in order to fulfill more perfectly the objectives which are proposed for the congregation in the Lord our God. Eighteen ninety four Constitutions. These constitutions were presented to the sacred congregation and received its approval on September twenty fifth, eighteen ninety four. They are what had been in effect until 1983. As far as education, they are much more explicit than prior legislation, establishing at this point the different types of education. First part. Chapter 21. Works of Zeal. Number 255. For what leads to the procurement of the spiritual good of its neighbors, the congregation dedicates itself to teach, free of charge, as many girls as come to its schools, principally the poor, it has academies where it admits boarders or semi-boarders, whom it educates and instructs in the Christian faith. Number 257. Coming now to the exterior means with which the congregation works for the good of its neighbors, it should before all else strive to employ them, 
where greater fruit can be expected. Therefore our academies or houses will be located in populous cities. All things being equal, the towns with less piety should be preferred, as well as those in which it is expected that greater and longer lasting fruit will be gained, or those which have by their example greater influence on others. Chapter 23. Academies. Number 271. Just as the congregation dedicates itself to the religious education of poor girls, because they need it, provided to them free of charge, it is also the proper work of our institute to provide the same benefits to girls of well-off families, because of the greater good that such girls can offer to society. Seen from this perspective, the Sacred Heart of Jesus is by no means uninterested in the work of academies, and therefore his handmaids must also take care to never view them with indifference. Number 272. Therefore, the congregation can found academies for young ladies, in which it will care for their instruction and education, in terms to be defined in the next chapter, being able to admit boarding students, in order to be accommodating to various family circumstances, and, where it seems convenient in the Lord, semi-boarders, and occasionally even day students who come in the morning and again in the afternoon to classes during the respective hours of classes, being attentive in all cases to the local circumstances. Number 275. All that will be stated in the following chapter about instruction and religious education will be applied with the same diligence to academy students. Moreover, we must strive with great care to give them an appropriate level of refinement, and even when studies are given the scope that circumstances demand, domestic skills appropriate for their sex must be taught with even greater determination, and among these last, the useful ones must not be left aside. Number 276. The means of accomplishing this will be determined according to the customs of the different countries, as well as the age and other qualities of girls to be admitted. Number 277. It will be a point of special concern to moderate the zeal for new academy foundations, so that they will have sufficient personnel to care for the academy and for adoration, without being overwhelmed. Adoration must not be omitted under any circumstances, in order to attend to the special objective of the Institute of making reparation to the heart of Jesus, especially in the most blessed sacrament, which all of ours will keep in mind, especially those who by their charges are responsible for the government of the congregation, so that never, under no pretext, should the worship of adoration be put in second place behind other works of zeal. Within said works of zeal, the education of poor girls must always be given preference over the instruction of young ladies in academies. Number 282. The tuition of boarders, semi-boarders, and academy day students will be set according to the circumstances of the various places. Chapter 24. Schools for poor girls. Number 283. They should remember, above all, that the goal of our schools and academies is to teach Christian doctrine and educate the girls in solid piety. The remaining instruction is a means, and although it should be given, it should never be put ahead of the desired end. Number 284. May everyone be persuaded that there is no work undertaken among us for the help of our neighbors more useful than that of teaching them Christian doctrine. For this reason, ours ought to be diligently trained in this activity from the novitiate, and always know it to be specially recommended in the congregation. Number 285. Besides the catechism of Christian doctrine, reading, writing, and arithmetic will be taught in our schools, along with that which according to the customs of the various places is taught to girls, carefully ensuring that they learn the domestic skills appropriate for their sex. Number 287. In our schools we will strive to admit the greatest possible number of girls that staffing and facilities permit, setting in each house a minimum and maximum age for admission, according to circumstances. We will try to separate the girls, distributing them into two or more sections, paying attention not only to their ages, but also to their development and needs. Number 288. On all weekdays that are not holidays as defined by the regulations, according to the diverse climates and customs of the countries in which the houses are located, 
the school day will be approximately five to six hours. Number 290. In reference to exams, prizes, and other methods of stimulating the diligence and good behavior of the girls, and also referring to the corrections, which will be given them, it can only be said that the incentive of a reward should be preferred whenever possible to fear of a punishment, which must always be very moderate and never given in a moment of impatience. Number 291. May they have special care to continue to educate the girls religiously, which is the objective of these schools. Number 292. May ours remember to commend the students to God in their prayers and to edify them with their good example. May it be their intention, in everything they do for them, to bring them to love God, and may they always begin and end classes with some sort of brief prayer. Number 294. No alms or gifts of any kind will be accepted from poor girls, from their families, either for Christmas or the Superior Saint's Day, or any other occasion. Number 295. Everything in the poor schools must be truly free of charge, including books, paper, and other similar objects for those who need them.